On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Ranil Vikramasinghe, President of the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka, Head of State, and to invite him to address the Assembly. The Chairman of the General Assembly, His Excellency Dennis Francis, President of the General Assembly, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I congratulate His Excellency Dennis Francis of Trinidad and Tobago on his election as the President of the 78th Session of the United Nations General Assembly. I extend my sincere condolences to the victims and families of the natural disasters that hit Morocco and Libya in recent days. We stand in solidarity with our Moroccan and Libyan friends during this difficult time. Mr. President, rebuilding trust and reigniting solidarity is an appropriate point of departure not only for reflecting on the challenges before the multilaterals today, but also for reviewing developments in my own country, Sri Lanka, over the past year. At this time last year, amidst multiple global crises, Sri Lanka was experiencing its most challenging period in recent times, socially, economically, and politically, which had a devastating impact on people's lives. Even our democratic traditions were threatened by attempts to occupy our parliament and bring it to a halt. Nevertheless, we succeeded in bringing about a democratic political transition due to our deeply entrenched and resilient democratic tra traditions. Restoring to the regraduation of Sri Lanka's economy, coupled with the gift of fertilizer from the United States government, which led to a bumper harvest, has assisted us in ensuring stability during that period. The reforms I have since initiated in the economic financial, institutional, and reconciliation fronts have been directed on the one hand towards rebuilding trust and confidence between the people and the government, and on the other, towards laying the foundation for economic stabilization and recovery. Sri Lankans are already witnessing the positive outcomes of these measures in their daily lives, and the revival of confidence internally and externally in the progress of the country. It is my intention to lead the country towards sustainable and stable recovery and growth, which will benefit all segments of Sri Lankan society in all parts of the country, ensuring a future of peace, prosperity, and uh, reconciliation for the present and future generations of women and men. In reaching this goal, we will be accompanied by the support, trust, and solidarity of our own people and of the international community. Mr. President, as we turn the corner towards the 80th anniversary of the UN and prepare for the summit of the future in 2024, we see the fragmented geopolitical landscape of a multipolar world where new centers of global power have emerged. Accompanying this systemic change are, on one hand, great expectations of development and human progress, with millions of people rising out of poverty to prosperity. On the other hand, we see a world where former big power rivalries and geopolitical tensions have reignited in open war, overlapping with new theaters of conflict and tension on land and in the oceans. Security alliances have expanded, and recent arrangements have been formed to deal with strategic threats, perceptions in old and new theaters of conflict. North-South divisions are widening with the digital divide, the financial and debt crisis, and the energy transition. Contrary to the promise of 2030, today we are seeing levels of poverty and hunger not witnessed in decades. Neutral, non-aligned countries of the global south, such as Sri Lanka, are once again constrained in between new global power configurations. Uh, 
facing those who do not respect the sovereignty of our nations. In numerous recent declarations in the UN and beyond, including at the G20 in Delhi, the BRICS in Pretoria, and G7 in Hiroshima, we have agreed that our challenges are interconnected across borders and all other divides. We must grasp the opportunity to unite in order to build an inclusive future. It is an appropriate reflection of this current global predicament that the theme for this year's general debate is rebuilding trust and reuniting global solidarity. Mr. President, this year, in parallel with the UNGA, we have participated in three interrelated summits dealing with the accelerating the SDGs, financing for development, and climate ambition, where we agreed that international solidarity and collective action is needed to address these simultaneously. Cross-border financial impact of the crisis, such as climate change and the pandemic, are impending the ability of smaller indebted countries, such as mine, to make progress on the SDGs and climate adaptation and mitigation. Conflicts and tensions among big powers are complicating the policy environment for the rest by adding uncertainty to economic and macro financial stability, disrupting supply chains, causing inflation, as well as food and energy sec security. <clears throat> Long before the SDGs, Sri Lanka has achieved high human and social development indicators, which ranked us in a category well above the other middle income countries. <clears throat> Neither has Sri Lanka shirked its responsibility to the planet. Last year at COP27, we outlined our climate ambition plan. We said that by 2030, we will have 70% renewable energy in electricity generation, increase forest cover by 32%, and reduce greenhouse em emissions by 14.5%. We will phase out coal by 2040 and reach net zero by 2050. Our low-carbon development trajectory gave us one of the lowest per capita carbon emission rates for a lower MIC country. This year, as a result of heterogeneous shocks and debt, the incremental progress we were proud to have reached have been reversed. Food inflation, putting significant pressure on food security amongst vulnerable communities. At the same time, children's education and nutrition have suffered due to the pandemic and uh, economic crisis. In parallel, last month, Sri Lanka, we were grappling with the driest weather spell seen in recent years, followed by torrential rainfalls. <coughs> Adverse uh, climatic outcome in a community uh, spilling over is spilling over onto a tight fiscal space just as we begin to stabilize from last year's economic crisis. As a climate vulnerable developing country in debt crisis, the urgency to mobilize climate finance is greater today than it was ever before. However, despite promises made to which we were all witnesses, the rich countries are not delivering to expectation. Developed countries must do their part and fulfill what they agreed, assume their share of the common but differentiated responsibility, provide assistance for mitigation and adaptation and compensation for loss and damage. Mr. President, national efforts alone will not suffice to ensure the success of the SDGs and reverse climate change. The need for global solidarity to restructure international financial architecture is paramount. This is articulated loud and clear in multiple global fora, including in G20 and the BRICS. The Secretary General's SDG stimulus highlights the interconnections between the achievements of the SDGs combating climate change and the concrete interventions required by creditors, sovereign and private, as well as by IFS, including to mitigate the debt crisis. It is estimated that the 2008 financial crisis cost the U.S. economy uh, $4 trillion, 
Recent studies in U U.S. have stated that the imp impact of the pandemic on the U.S. economy from 2020 to 2023 would reach uh, $14 trillion. These numbers would more than double if the rest of the global economy is added. We have not faced an economic crisis of this magnitude any time before in our modern history. The cost of World War II in today's U.S. dollars would amount only to $4 trillion, and the Marshall Plan would be $150 billion. This is the magnitude of the challenge before us. <clears throat> Therefore, if we are unable to restructure the global fiscal order, then certainly we will fail in the struggle to reverse climate change and achieve the SDG goals. There is still time for course correction as the crisis has not reached its peak. At the same time, Paris Summit for a new global financing pact will come up with the funding requirements. Therefore, the summit for the future should not be crafting new programs, but restructuring the present financial architecture to see, soothe the needs of climate change and sustainable development. Mr. President, this must be the priority of the General Assembly. We cannot afford to allow divisions to drive focus away from this crisis. While key issues such as the Bridgetown Initiative and the necessity to address the debt of low-income countries are being discussed in this assembly. It's not commanding the attention it deserves. Unfortunately, the Security Council has failed to give priority to these connected issues of climate change, debt relief, and sustainable development. This impacts the future of the mankind. The survival of the planet must be our priority. We cannot afford to go into this war with a divided high command. The future of all species on the globe is dependent on our ability to put aside our rivalries until this crisis is solved. Multilateral machinery, which reflects the world of the past century, needs to be reformed to meet the challenges of the present and the future. A machinery which has failed to find a solution to the long-standing Palestine question. The composition of the Security Council must be expanded to be representative of current global diversity and decision making. In parallel, the role of the UN General Assembly must be strengthened. We are asking that the permanent members engage in a credible dialogue which will lead to a unified approach to combat these threats ahead of the next sessions. I would like to repeat again, we are asking that the permanent members engage in a credible dialogue which will lead to a unified approach to combat these threats ahead of the next sessions. Mr. President, while we seek solidarity and financing to alleviate poverty and climate challenges, global military expenditure has risen today to a record level, reaching $2.24 trillion. This reflects the strategic trust deficit among the powerful key arms control framework which were instrumental in mating system stability in the past which have collapsed. And nuclear conflict is once again under open discussion, potentially and apocalyptically triggered by autonomous controls. We urge restraint in the increase of military expenditure which leads to escalation of conflict. Developing countries have been the voice of sanity and reason in this regard for decades. In keeping with Sri Lanka's long-standing position, support your disarmament of the weapons of mass destruction and nuclear weapons. This year, Sri Lanka ratified the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Yesterday, we accepted, acceded to the Treaty on Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. The war in Ukraine has far-reaching and severe financial and humanitarian repercussions on food, hunger and debt in all parts of the world, including Sri Lanka. It is recalled that the UN Charter rests on powerful states uh, in the Security Council, the responsibility to maintain international peace and security and to de-escalate rather than ignite conflict. We need to hold the momentum where this 
and other big power tensions are spilling over into established areas of international rules-based cooperation forged over decades of multilateral negotiation, ranging from international trade to uh, ocean governance. Mr. President, this international system is today undergoing vast changes. At the same time, it's been confronted with unprecedented challenges. We come to the United Nations to demonstrate solidarity in arriving at common solutions. What is at stake is not the future of the United Nations, but our planet as a whole. Member states will need to find new ways of working together despite increasing mistrust that has per permeated international relations. We who have not been able to find a solution to the Palestinian question must now be able at least to find a solution to the uh, questions which threaten the existence of the present global community. And this can be achieved through the willingness of the permanent members to work together in solidarity with the developing world. They must show the way. Thank you. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka, Head of State, for the statement just made, and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will now hear an address by His Excellency Denis Sasu Ngeso, the President of the Republic of Congo. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. <laughs> 